and I want to subtitle this message back to the river and and I will expound upon this in just a little bit let me review quickly it was November 17th we preached in regard to the anointing and and subtitled the message ask for the rain and Job 38 and 28 poses a question. It says, does the rain have a father? Who fathers the drops of dew? And the conclusion we came to in that message and in this verse is he's not talking about rain. He's talking about the working of the Spirit of God. And throughout Scripture, prophetically, the rain represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit that is coming down. And then the first Sunday of this month, continuing on the anointing, we preached about the favor of God. And in doing so, and I will elaborate on this again in just a little bit, I think, for Jesus came out of the wilderness experience and, and he went into the synagogue and said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. And he described the ministry that he was anointed to do. And in verse 19, to proclaim. In the King James, I think it says, the acceptable year of the Lord. And that word acceptable means the favored. And most translation says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I... I'll show you something here in a little while, I believe, as we get to it. I think this message in first service, out of all of these messages, this so far, this is the only one that I got out of my introduction. But I've got to complete this message in order to satisfy it. And, and so I trust for the anointing of the Lord to serve it to you this morning. And a week ago, we preached on the subtitle of Fresh oil and the word oil in both the old and new testament refers to the spirit of god and a fresh touch of the spirit of god in psalms 92 and verse 10 david declares i have been anointed with fresh oil he had been anointed when he was a boy to become king now that he's king he's anointed with fresh a fresh touch of the Spirit of God. And, and this is what God wants to do in your life. God does not want us to dwell on what he did yesterday, but on what he wants us to do today. God is so good. God is so faithful. And he wants to anoint you. But I want to minister this morning, and maybe not so much on the, on the concept of the anointing, but primarily this morning, in regard to the Spirit of God and what the Spirit of God is doing in our lives. Now, as we begin, I want to read in Psalms 48 and verse 4, but let me explain as we begin. So many things in the Old Testament are prophetically symbolic of things that were to come. And in fact, in, Malik, or in uh, Zechariah chapter 3, it speaks of Two men, Joshua the high priest and Jerubbabel the governor. And in chapter 3, it says these men are symbolic of things to come. So God uses things, people, and places to be symbolic of things to come, to be symbolic and show us prophetically of what he wants to do. And the Old Testament took us to Christ. And it's in Christ that we have the fullness. It's in the New Testament that we have the fullness of all things from God and from Christ. Now, Psalms 46 and verse 4. It says, There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. Wow. Now, notice what it says. It says there is a. It's a specific Thing. There is a ri river, a specific river. And with all of the rivers and streams around the world, he was speaking here of a particular one, and he was speaking prophetically because he was speaking about the Holy Spirit himself. And the word river 
refers, even in the New Testament, as well as throughout the Old, when you read the places where it speaks of the river, and I'll show you several places, he's speaking of the Spirit of God. Remember, Jesus said in John chapter 7, out of, the King James says, out of your belly, most translations will say something like this, out of your inner being will flow rivers or streams of of living water and it says Jesus spoke this in referring to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to flow through you, into you and through you. And it's like a river. A river cuts its own course following the path of least resistance. And what he wants of you is to be a path of least resistance so that when he flows into you, he can, you will not resist and he can flow through you. If you resist, he is unable to flow through you. But when you surrender, submit, and yield, then he can flow through you and do the things that he desires to do. And that's why it says here there is a river. And that river is the Holy Spirit himself. There is a river whose streams, because he doesn't flow just as one channel you might say he splits and divide because he's flowing through each one of you now this is the exciting thing there is a river whose streams and see on earth there's so many things that uh, that are prophetic and and in the old testament that is kind of a reversal of what is to be in the uh, what we see uh, uh, in the new testament or or what was being shown here is uh, something that, a, a river, a river, let me say it this way, a river is flowing and tributaries flow into it. Tributaries flow into it and makes it swell and swell and swell. But there's something about the Spirit of God when he flows, and I'll show you a little bit. When he flows from the throne of God, then he begins to flow through the many streams. Have you ever heard of a river breaking up into a thousand streams or, or whatever? You always see in the natural the tributaries, the streams feeding the river, and it cuts its course down to the broad ocean. But there's something, and I'll show you in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 10. It says that there was a river watering the garden, and it flowed from Eden. Now, this one right here, it shows it breaking up in, into four different things. It said from there, this river that flowed from Eden, from there, it, separa it separated into four headwaters. Now, I feel like I need to rush in order to cover this, but I'm aware I need to be careful not to rush in order to explain it. There, it was a river watering the garden that flowed from Eden. The garden was the garden of Eden. The word Eden means paradise. And it was the place where God dwelt. And remember in Eden it was where Adam talked with God. The Bible said in the cool of the day. In the evening of the day. And he talked with God. Jesus, if you remember, when he hung on the cross, there was a thief, one on each side. One repented, one did not. The one who repented, Jesus said, today, today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, paradise, where he was going, and the Garden of Eden, paradise, it was a habitation of God. And that Eden is no longer on the earth as such. But it's a place where God is. But it's telling us out of the place where God is, out of the garden, there was a river that flowed from it. And in this scripture, that river is not named. But it says it was separated into four headwaters. And it tells us the names that are of rivers that are here today. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic rosin and onyx are also there. Now, where the Spirit of God flows, it flows and takes you to the promises of God, to the good things of God. And that's what this scripture is depicting here. And this, these particular scriptures are saying things much more broad than I'm capable of understanding myself. But I've prayed over this setting of scripture for many, many years. 
many years. And when I read it years ago, I don't even know how many years ago, and I seen there's this river flowing from the garden, the place where God dwells. And I seen it breaks into four rivers, and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed for many years. I don't know how many times I have prayed asking God to give me understanding of what he is saying here. And actually, it was just late last night or early this morning when God showed it to me. And ministering in this realm about the anointing and the river of God, and he showed me. He said, it's the Holy Spirit, and he breaks up. And here into four. You see, four is the number of the church. And I don't have time to go in and explain all of that. If I did, I would not be able to deliver this message. There's two numbers that are whole and complete. The number three is a complete number. And the number three is the complete number of God. There's a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And every time you read the number three or even 30 or even 300, you will see it's something that pertains to a work that God is doing, only God is doing. The number seven is a complete number. And, and it pertains to the church. You know, there were four Gospels and, and Ezekiel uh, chapter 1 where it talks about the, the, the four beasts. And they had four faces which depicts the different temperaments of mankind. And, and the Spirit was upon them. And, and they would move this way, up or down or this way. It said they did not turn, but they only went where the Spirit led them. And they weren't turning and looking. And it was by the Kendra or I don't remember, Kidra, I don't remember how to pronounce it, Kidron River. You see, again, the river is representing the Spirit of God. And by the river of the Spirit of God, these four living creatures that represent the church just move in accordance to how and where the Holy Spirit wants to take them. And, and that's enough of four of trying to explain it. Uh, there's so much more. But four represents the church. Three represents the Trinity, the wholeness of God. And when you put all of them together, you have the number seven that represents the perfect number of man. They tell us that six is the number of man, but it's not the perfect number of man. And when God worked through men, if you remember in the Old Testament, there would be seven days of cleansing if they touched a dead person. Well, seven meant the wholeness, the whole number, the complete number of man. Seven times around Jericho as they marched themselves. And then on the seventh day, seven times around again. It was seven days and then seven times on the seventh day as they marched around again, the walls fell in. So it showed the perfect number of man as man was doing the will of God. Four and three equals seven, and you put them together, you have the perfect number of, of man. Now, let me say this. It's like the other day, there was someone running for office, and we were in, uh, getting to be with them, ask questions, more or less interview candidates. And, and one man made the statement, he, he, he was going to compromise and and he was not going to hold anybody accountable if we'd just vote him into office. And, and my mind is, you know, tilt, tilt, tilt. And anyway, and, and so I began to ask him questions, and I didn't memorize everything I said. But finally, he said, I'll have you know. I always love it when they, I'll have you know. You know, it's it probably, anyway, he was trying to convince me of something. He said, I'll have you know. I'm a deacon at such and such church in such and such town. And I don't know. It just came out of me. I just said, I said, that means nothing to me. It just means nothing to me. I've been around some deacons. I've been around some preachers myself, you know. And that just gets where it means nothing to me. What I want to know is, are you in God and is he in you? And are you going to live right and stand for what is right? Four is the number of the church. Don't try to be a part of a church and live like the devil. Don't try to be a part of the church and believe like the devil wants you to believe. 
If you're in the church and you get the Trinity and it comes together, then you have the perfect number of man. And I don't care what your rank, title, affiliation is or anything to do with a so-called church. If you don't have it right with God and if you're not in God and he's not in you, then it means nothing to me. And it means, it means nothing to God except you need to get saved, you need to accept Christ, you need to do what is right and come together and find the wholeness of God in you. It's not the affiliation of a church. It's not that you, your mother and father, your dad was a preacher or anything like that. It only pertains to your relationship with God and what you allow him to be to you and allow him to be in you. I mean, does that make any sense? Yeah. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. So here it goes on about the other rivers. The name of the second river is Jahan, it winds through the entire land of Cush. Jahan winds through the land. And everywhere we will allow him to flow, so he will flow. That's why we need him in the church. That's why we need him in the home. That's why we need him uh, in Congress. That's why we need him in D.C. We really need him in Austin. That's why we need him everywhere. That we need him in the educational department. We need him everywhere we go, letting him wind through the entire land. The name of the third river is Tigris, and it runs along the east side of Ashur. Uh, the fourth river is Euphrates. The emphasis here is not to be placed on the natural, but on that which is spiritual. Does this make any sense? Praise God. I need to pause a moment, and let's make this a ministry moment. If your thoughts are always focused on the things around you, you may not realize what is above you and what is inside of you. You see, you can get this focus so easy. One place the Bible says, says it like this, whoever loves pleasure will come to poverty. You know, if, if life to you is... It's just fun and games and pleasure and what can make you happy. You'll never, you'll never understand your purpose and you'll always be disappointed. And you'll never go into the land of promise. We need to be focused on the things that are spiritual. And so I want to take this moment and pray a short prayer with you, over you, that God will cause and allow us to be focused on the things that are spiritual Father, I bless this house, each one who are here. Let your spirit that dwells within us flow through us like rivers of living water, a mighty stream, a mighty river. And Father, minister to our hearts and our minds that we may stay focused on you, rendered and surrendered to you, Father, for your glory, your cause, and for your purpose. Father, let, let us never allow the things of the world, to be the attractions that deter us from seeking you and from following you. And Father, if that's the case, then let it cease in our lives so that we may follow you more completely and give to you all the glory that you deserve and render to you service, Father, for our benefit, I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. If you believe that, say amen. If you agree with that, just say amen. Amen. All the things of this earth will pass away, but the things of the word of God will, will remain. I need to rush on if I'm going to finish this. Deuteronomy 11, verses 10 through 11. He spoke the word. He said, the land you are entering to take over is not like the land of Egypt. He said, I have a promised land for you. And it's not like the land of Egypt when you were in bondage. And that, that represented the sin and the lifestyle of sin, the bondage of sin. He said, it's not like what was in Egypt. He continued, verse 10, but the land, or uh, verse 11, the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from the heaven. This deserves about an hour's worth of preaching. Quickly, the land you are going to take possession, and he threw this in. He did not say the land you are going to take possession, but he said it this way, the land you are crossing the Jordan to take possession you see here the Jordan River represented the 
Spirit of God, that river that flows through the land. You've got to cross that river. You've got to go through the Spirit in order to go into the promised land. They could not go into the promised land. They tried it 40 years prior, going through Kadesh Barnea, and 10 of the 12 spies failed, and they entered into doubt, fear, and rebellion. It's because they did not cross. There was no river at Kadesh Barnea to cross as they were going to enter through the south side into the promised land. They had to go around to the east side and go in. Into the, into the promised land, but they had to cross the river. And the river was at flood stage, and it was impossible for them to cross the river. Now, do you remember the story that we read about, the illustration, the prophetic illustration in Ezekiel, where he said, outflowing from under the threshold of the gate on the east side of the temple, there was a river, and it was flowing ankle deep, then knee deep, then waist deep, and then it became a river so great, so broad, so deep, you could not cross it. He was talking about the Spirit of God, and in order for them to go into the promised land here, it's written for our benefit prophetically for us to understand they went and here's a river impossible but in order to get to the promised land they have to they have to cross a river that is so deep and so broad and it's flowing so so strong they cannot cross it in the natural so God stops the river and it mounts up like a heap and they go on dry ground Someone said, well, what does the dry ground represent? This was the Old Testament. This was before the promise. It was dry ground before Christ. It was dry ground before the day of Pentecost and the Spirit was poured out. And so they had to go across on dry ground in order for that moment to be significant of what was yet to come. When they crossed, the river came down and started flowing again. The land you were crossing the Jordan to take possession of is a land of mountains and valleys that drinks rain from the heaven. Remember, the rain represents the anointing. And he wants to take us through the Spirit of God into that promised land. Now, there are some here that are hoping and wanting and longing for the benefits and the blessings and the promises of God, but you refuse to go by the Spirit. You refuse to do it the Spirit's way, and you keep wondering and questioning, when am I ever going to see and have and uh, then possess the blessings of God? But you keep evading over and over and over. I don't know why I'm emphasizing this, but you keep evading the way that God would have you to go. There is no other way, and the way God would have you to go is through His Spirit. You cannot do this on your own, in your own accord. Amen. Amen. Hello. Wake up. But it's by the Spirit of God going into the river that is so deep and so wide a man cannot cross over it. So he stopped the river. In verse 2 it said, It is a land the Lord God, your God cares for. The eyes of the Lord your God are continually on it from the beginning of the year to its end. This land, God, God cares about your promised land. And he cares about it, it said, from the beginning of the year to its end. What does that mean? He's speaking prophetically. And remember, Jesus said the anointing was upon him. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him to anoint him. And that this was the year of the Lord's favor. From beginning to the end, every year, when we're in the Spirit, every year, and we go into the promised land, every year is the year of God's favor. God's favor upon you. You see, God loves you, and he wants to do so much for you. But if you will not go in the river and cross to the promised land, there's very little he can do for you. Does this make any sense? I keep questioning, why was I anticipating a thunderous applause and a standing ovation? Amen. Guys, this is exciting. This is exciting. 
But too many times we want to do it every way except God's way. But we want everything that God promised. And we think God should do it our way. And God will not do it your way. Because your way will not work. It cannot work. You're of the natural. In order to have God's way, we have to be of the spiritual. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Wow, I've got to skip over some of this. Let's go to 2 Kings chapter 2. Goodness. Who would give me five extra minutes? Would anybody in here give me five extra? Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. Okay, we got time. We can do this. In 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. This was Elisha and Elijah walking together. And Elisha was hungering, having the call of God, and, and given himself, rendered himself to the call of God. He found himself with Elijah, who was the head, the top of all the prophets. And he, he had a very coveted place where he was in relationship with Elijah, you could say the chief prophet. And so he's with Elijah, and his desire is that he can have a double portion anointing that is up on Elijah. And none of the other prophets around seem to even have that hope. Guys, hope for the best. Pray for the best. But you will only have it when you go into the water that is more than ankle deep, more than knee deep, more than waist deep, going into the full stream of the Spirit of God. And so as these two were walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two men. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Wow. And then Elisha saw this and cried out, My father, my father, the chariots and horsemen of Israel. Why did he cry that? My father, my father, the chariots of horsemen in Israel. Uh, the chariots, what did he even say? The chariots and horsemen of Israel. Why did he say that? He had no clue what to say. What would you say? You know, wow. I would have probably said, wow. Wow, 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 you know. I don't know that that means anything. As far as I can tell, that means nothing except he was so amazed and so excited. He didn't know what to say, but he had to say something. And Elisha saw Elijah no more. And then he took hold of his own clothes, knowing the mantle of Elijah was left on the ground, the mantle that he would wear, the mantle that would bring the double portion anointing. And before he puts the mantle on, before he picks the mantle up, it said he takes care of his own clothes and tears them apart. What was he doing? He exchanged his old clothes for the new. He exchanged his past. For his future. He exchanged his plans for his purpose. Because now he has the anointing. Going into verse 13, he picked up the cloak or the mantle that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He went back to the river. He went back to the river. You see, guys, sometimes some of you just need to go back to the river. Back to the river. And get back again what you lost when you left the river. Just because it's impossible doesn't mean he doesn't want you in it. You see, it started out knee deep, or ankle deep. So you started wading in it somewhat. Then knee deep, waist deep. Then he said the river is so big, so broad, you can't cross it. You see, he want, the point is he doesn't want you... In the New Testament, crossing over the river, he wants you in the river. It is so broad you can't cross over it, and he wants you in the river, forfeiting your thoughts, your plans, your ideas, and surrendering to his. But as long as you hold on to your thoughts, your plans, your ideas, which are usually the thoughts and the plans and the ideas of the world you're embracing and separating you from the thoughts and plans of the Spirit of God, the only way you're going to have the thoughts, plans, and the purpose of the Spirit of God is to get into the river, get into the river. And now Elisha goes back, back to there, back to the river. And he takes the cloak. 
that had fallen from Elijah, and he struck the water with that mantle. And he said, where now is the Lord, the God of Elijah? And when he struck the water, it divided to the right and to the left, and he crossed over again on dry ground. And the river stopped from the direction it was flowing, and the, it stopped here, and it stopped here. Does that make sense? I mean, if you stop the river, if it's flowing that way and you stop it here, it should run out and empty. But it was significant here. It stopped on this side and it stopped on this side so he could cross over. This was symbolic. It was prophetically symbolic of what God was do, would be doing later. And he crossed over. But it was saying in no way could a man stop, retain, or hinder the flow of the Spirit of God, the flow of the river of God. And when it stopped, it was enough for him to pass over. But it stops here as a river. It stops here is a river, and when he crossed over, it began flowing again. Wow. Isn't it amazing what is in the Word of God? Yes. Praise God. It divided, and he crossed over. And then the company, in verse 15, of the prophets from Jericho who were watching said, The spirit of Elijah is resting on Elisha. <clears throat> and what we see is... He had a double anointing, and Elisha performed what was recorded. He performed twice as many miracles as Elijah had performed under the anointing. He had a double portion anointing. Wow, let me invite you to stand. Back to the river. Back to the river. And I would like to encourage you, if you've ever been in the river, go but you feel like you've, maybe you even felt like you crossed over and into the land of promise, but you've kind of meandered around, failed to keep your focus. And I won't elaborate, but maybe you sense, feel, and know that today you need to go back to the river. I want to lead you in a prayer of what we might say is a prayer of salvation, a prayer of renewal and commitment. See, I, I do not believe any of you are here by accident. If you were somewhere else, I might say, well, that's an accident. You should have been here. <laughs> but you're not here by accident. God has so much for you. And he showed you through his word, and he shows you every day his goodness, his grace, and the fullness of his love. And all he asks is for a place of commitment, a place of renewal. I decided a long time ago, I'll never, I don't know how to be perfect before God. So in a sense, it makes me feel like I could never please God, although because of his grace that he places over me and the spirit he puts within me, I find myself disposed at his pleasure and he is pleased because I render and surrender to him over and over and over again. And now is a good time to go back to that place of salvation. If you've never accepted Christ as Savior, if you've never made him your Lord, the place of salvation, the place of renewal, the place of commitment, the place of surrender, that place where God wants you to be. If you'd like to do that, I'd like to lead you in a prayer, and I will lead you in a prayer of salvation. You can pray, but even... If you want to come to a place of surrender, commitment, renewal, this is a good prayer to pray. Or pray something in your own words from your heart. And be sincere as we pray in full confidence that he hears our prayers. And see, the things you ask of God are always things you cannot do or create yourself or within yourself. And that's why we go to him. And so when we ask him for these things, and submit, then he starts doing the things that we want in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I believe you. You are my God. You're the creator of heaven and earth. You're the God of eternity. You are the lover of my soul. 
I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, your only begotten son, whom you sent to this world through a virgin named Mary. He came as a baby and became a man where he gave himself as a sacrifice for my salvation, a sacrifice for my soul. It was by the shedding of his blood that my sins are cleansed and I am washed. I accept Jesus as my Savior and I make Jesus my Lord. Jesus, you are my Lord. Father, I will serve you all the days of my life. Forgive me of my sin and wash me and make me clean. Cleanse me from my shame. Remove shame from me and me from my shame. And heal and deliver me from my pain. I trust you. Jesus is my Savior, my Lord. You are my God. And I surrender all to you because of him in his name, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you believe that, say amen. If you prayed that prayer, give him praise. God is so good. He is so faithful and he loves you so much. I love you so much. He is the lover of your soul. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, please let me know or someone know. We want to help you in your walk as you serve and follow him and as you draw nearer to him. God bless you so much.